Hello everyone. In this video, we will be discussing the practical applications of computational chemistry. In our past videos, we have discussed the basics of computational chemistry, theories behind computational chemistry and various methods used in computational chemistry. This video is intended on the practical applications, that is the various programs and methods used in computational chemistry and how to select the suitable program or method if you are doing any project or research work in computational chemistry. And please note that this video is the definite feature in a tutorial. If you want to see tutorials regarding Autodoc, Autodoc Vina or any other softwares, please visit my channel. There are some tutorial videos already uploaded. In this, we will be discussing the peripherals of applications of practic practical applications of computational chemistry. So, the first one, cracking some myths. As you know that computational chemistry is a very recent topic and it is continuously developing in a fast pace. There are some myths regarding computational chemistry. And the basics of these myths are, since it is a recent topic, there are comparatively less number of researchers or experts in this field compared to other fields like nano or polymer, which are much developed. So naturally, there will be some myths. On the first slide, I will be cracking some myths regarding computational chemistry. So the first myth is that no need for supervision. That means you don't need any supervision if you are doing computational chemistry experiments. No, that is wrong and it is absurd because you can't expect the computer to give a proper result if you are just running a program in the morning and waiting for the result in the afternoon. You can't do that. You need to supervise each and every step. You need to supervise what the computer is doing. You need to verify that you are using the correct program and the computer is using the correct algorithm. So no need of supervision is the first myth. You need to supervise the pro program you are running. Then. No theory base is needed. Actually, computational chemistry is a theoretical chemistry. You need to understand the theory behind the program you are using, the method you have chosen, and the experiment you are doing. For example, if you are doing a protein ligand docking experiment, you need to understand the chemistry of the protein and the ligand. Then only you can expect a reliable result. If you don't know anything about uh, the chemistry of the ligand or the protein, then you will get, you may get a wrong result. So a strong theory base is needed in computational chemistry. Then the next one is that you need a supercomputer to do it. And in some of my uh, past videos, many people have commented that what is the system requirement required for this program or what is the uh, system that I need to use for running a program. It depends upon the program and your molecule system chosen. For example, if you are running an autodoc simulation or any quantum espresso program using a very small system, then an i3 laptop may be sufficient. The only thing is that it may take some more time, but still you can run the program. You definitely do not need a supercomputer to run an entry level program. And also, even if you don't have a supercomputer, you can access other computers or cluster of computers or any higher high quality workstations in your workplace or in your research cluster. There is always a possibility that you can use other system require other systems with higher configuration as your working system. There are many ways in which their uh, workstations may be shared nowadays. You can share it by online. You don't need to go for any um, perfectly high, high configuration systems. And also please note that if you are doing some uh, basic level programs and you are relying on some basic level programs with lesser number of atoms, then your laptop will be more than enough. Then the next myth, and that is to be mentioned in a very special way, one super program. See, when we are saying that I'm doing computational chemistry, I'm doing my research in computational chemistry, some people may ask you, which is the program that you are using? And we know that we can't specify a single program. Computational chemistry is not based on a single program. You may need many programs to do your experiment. That is the basics of computational chemistry. You can't rely on one super program. There is no program like that. Use different programs. And in, in the current scenario, even if you do a computational experiment using a single program, the same experiment may be repeated and the concordance may be verified by using a different program, which is using a comparatively different algorithm and scoring function so that you get reliable result. So the concept of one super program is a myth and it's wrong then less time is required. See, 
the time limit for computational programs is actually a problem when you are dealing with very large systems. Sometimes you may, it may take weeks or months to run a calculation. Then anyone can do it. That's another myth. So if you are running short of time and you are running uh, short of lab resources, then okay, I'll go for computational chemistry. No, that's wrong. Anyone cannot do this. You need a strong theory base in computational chemistry, quantum mechanics and other all organic, if you are doing with the organic experiments, then you need a strong base in organic chemistry and if you are going with metal clusters, band structures, etc., you need a strong base in solid state chemistry like that. Anyone cannot do it. Computational chemistry requires a lot of time and effort in studying it. And the last one, everything is correct. No, that's wrong. Everything you obtain in computational chemistry as a result is not correct. It may not be correct and it, is, it, it cannot be reliable or whatever. See, if the system says this is correct, no, that doesn't mean it is correct. There may be some exceptions. We have to verify it. See, consider this picture. This picture shows a boy standing below a mango tree and I have given the pick credits to the prospective owner. And in this image, you can see that the boy is standing below this mango tree. Suppose there is a mango here in this spot and it's approximately 15 foot tall. So what is the probability that this boy is getting that mango? There are many other, po there are many possibilities that the mango may automatically fall down or this boy may throw a stone at the mango or he can use a ladder to climb the tree or he can just climb the tree. There are many possibilities like that. So if you are giving the computer an input like that boy is having a ladder, the ladder is 10 foot tall, the boy is 5 feet tall and the mango is at 15 feet height, then the boy can get the mango. The computer will give you a result that the boy can get a mango. But suppose you are giving an input like the boy is 15 foot tall or the computer is assuming that the boy is 15 feet tall. It's absurd because on the end of the day, you won't see 15 foot tall boys walking through the park. So that is wrong. So that is why everything is not correct when you are doing a computational experiment. See, I have, by this example, I think it is clear. The computer may assume that this boy is 15 feet tall. If he is 15 feet tall, then he can climb, he can just pluck the mango from the uh, ground. But that is wrong. The boy is not 15 feet tall. And there is another possibility. The computer may assume that the boy can fly towards the mango. And that's wrong. He can't do that. So that's why we say, we need supervision in each and every step. We need to understand what the computer is assuming from the system. If it is assuming that the boy can fly, it will give you a result that the boy can easily pull that mango. No, the boy can't fly. We know that. So, we need to provide supervision. We need to know the theory. We need to know the theory that boy can fly. So, in this example, since we are discussing a boy and a mango tree, we may easily conclude that the boy can't fly. But if you are dealing with any large system or any bio, uh, any uh, micro scale system, you may, in, the, in that case, boy is the system and flying or the height of the boy is actually the property or chemical property of the system. That's why I said you need a theoretical base on the system that you are doing and the program that you have chosen. That is very, very important. Then introduction to computational chemistry, a bunch of questions. What is computational chemistry? What is the need for computational techniques? How to use computational chemistry? The theory behind computational chemistry or is theory important in computational chemistry? Efficiency, reliability and accuracy. So, we will be dealing with all these questions in the following slides. First question, what is computational chemistry? In this, tech, in this uh, video, I won't be discussing much about the basics of computational chemistry because I have already done it in my other past videos. The link will be provided in the description. You may please visit that or you may please visit my website for those details. So, what is computational chemistry? Yeah, of course, this slide explains it all. And the need for computational techniques. Why do you need computational techniques? To make chemical predictions, predict new molecules or reaction, to supplement the experimental studies and more studies means better result. That's common sense. That's logic. Then, how to use computational chemistry? And we will be discussing in this video the questions from here on. How to use computational chemistry? First one, as I said, you need to know the theory. The boy is never 15 foot tall. You need to know the theory. Have an idea about the experiment. What you want to do? 
the boy needs to pluck a mango which is 15 foot high. You have to have an idea about the experiment. Choose the right method. Never select the wrong method. You can't select a method which assumes that the boy can fly because the method may only consider a crow or a pigeon as a living being. So if you give the boy as a living being, then it may consider the boy can fly like the crow or a pigeon. So select a method which uses the parameters that you have given. If the, if the method or if the program, choose the right program, if the method or the program doesn't include your molecule or any atoms in the molecule, then omit it or substitute it with, with any other method or program. So uh, the point 3 and 4 will be discussed later in this video. Then understand your resources. See, if you are using a system, you need to have an idea about the maximum potential output from your system. You can't rely on a system to produce a result which is equivalent to a very high configuration workstation. That means it cannot uh, deal with very high, highly demanding programs which require high computing cap capability. So you need to uh, identify your resources and know that. So in my case, I was using a laptop in, in the first stages of my research and now I have changed to a uh, desktop system. That is because if you are running for a program, like when I am doing my molecular mechanics or molecular dynamic simulations, it may take days to complete a simulation. So if the system is continuously running for two to three days in a row, if you are using a laptop, that may cause some problems because the laptop, the heat delivering mechanism, etc. for a laptop may be limited but compared to a desktop. If you are using a desktop, a desktop is much more reliable than a laptop because desktop is having comparatively more number of fans and also it occupies more area. It has a very good cooling system. So I changed to a desktop and now I'm using the same programs and even though the desktop configuration is higher than that of a laptop, I'm getting more bit accurate result and not, not accurate, more um, uh, what more uh, fast result when I'm using the desktop. So understand your resources. Then correlate the results with practical experiments. See, you have to understand one thing. Computational chemistry is never a substitute to your lab experiment. You cannot substitute your lab experiments completely with computational chemistry. You can get a theoretical idea about your lab experiments. You can simulate your lab experiments. You can predict your lab experiments. Anything you can do. But the computational chemistry experiment that you have obtained or the computational result that you have obtained is valid only when it is proved in a lab. Science or typically chemistry is based on lab experiment and the proof. So we need experimental proof. If you get a good result in computational chemistry, but it is not reproducible in the lab, then it is a waste until it gets proved in the lab. So you have to note that computational chemistry is never, ne it is never an alternative or a substitute to the lab experiment. But the only thing is that a computational chemist can provide a proper theoretical base a prediction on the reaction or the uh, reaction mechanism or any other factors, the energy or anything like that to a lab experiment. But it doesn't mean that computational chemistry can substitute a lab experiment. Then use different programs and check for concordance. As I mentioned earlier, in previous days we were using only one program and the result obtained from this program was uh, con con consolidated and it was published. But as, uh, as the current scenario, there, is, there are some changes that more than one programs have been checked for the same molecule and same system so that we get concordant result. Not even concordant, but the results from various programs are to be tabulated. This is in fact to increase the accuracy of the result because some programs may use different scoring functions or algorithms. For example, if you are using an atom like um, uh, selenium. I'm just giving example selenium. If one of the program is having a parameters preset for selenium and if the other program is having a parameter which is more accurate, then the second program will be giving an accurate result. So we are checking with the different programs to the accuracy. So this is how to use computational chemistry. Please note the seven points. Then the theory. Computational chemistry is based on strong theoretical aspects starting from quantum mechanics. You need theory to do computational chemistry. You should have a basic idea about the algorithms, scoring functions, false field or any other parameters that you are using. See, in my past video about molecular mechanics, I have described what is false field. If you are choosing the right false field, then you may get the right answer. If you are using a wrong false field, then you may get the wrong answer. Then it is your choice to choose the right program. 
one mistake may result in serious error. And in the next slides that are coming, we may discuss about various programs so that you can identify which is the right program that suits your requirement. If you are using the wrong program, then that may result in serious error. Okay, so this is the basic logic, garbage in, then garbage out. In computational chemistry, actually there is no wrong output. There is only a wrong input. There is no wrong output, but there is a wrong input. If you are giving a wrong input, you will get a wrong output. That is why we say garbage in, then garbage out. If you give the wrong input, you will get a wrong answer. Then the efficiency, reliability and accuracy. As we have mentioned in the past four questions, efficiency, reliability and accuracy depends upon main factor, many factors, that is the theoretical knowledge, the program selected, the system selected, the method selected, inputs given and the atoms chosen. See, everything depends upon, accuracy depends upon many factors like this. For example, if you are con considering a system, uh, any protein or any biological system, and if you are considering it, it to be optically inactive, if you are considering the R and F designation individually, that means you are not com considering them separately, then you may get the result. But in fact, the biological activity of this R configuration and S configuration may be different. So it depends upon many factors that means the input chosen input given atoms chosen etc so accuracy cannot be explained by any one of these it depends upon all these factors and these are the methods in computational chemistry and we'll be discussing it in the next video thank you